Welcome back. I'm Roger Stone, and you're, yes, you're at the right place. This is the War Room with Roger Stone and my colleague Owen Scheuer. We're going to be taking your calls a bit later, but it is rare that we're able to make history here on uh, the cable. But yesterday, we did make history here at the War Room um, when I revealed startling information discovered by... Uh, a uh, writer and uh, Princeton graduate and esteemed journalist, J.C. Hawkins, uh, who lives uh, in my native state of Florida and who edits a terrific blog called The Forgotten Street. Now, Mr. Hawkins has written an extraordinary book called Betrayal at Bethesda. This is uh, the story of three great Americans, Defense Secretary James V. Forrestal, a Democrat, Senator uh, and later President John F. Kennedy, and Senator Joseph R. McCarthy. And I believe joining us now, not to be confused with screaming Jay Hawkins, is J.C. Hawkins, the author of this extraordinary must-read book. Are you with us, Mr. Hawkins? Hey, Roger, certainly am. Thanks for that introduction. Well, you have written an extraordinary piece of history, but I'm going to go right to it, because yesterday I revealed a missing piece of history that I had not known. Now, as you know, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency and their longtime moles in the media, who they were paying then, according to the most recently declassified documents, and they are probably playing today, insisted that our Bay of Pigs invasion failed because JFK refused to order uh, air support for our men, or I should say the Cuban men we had trained who were storming the beaches of Cuba. What I learned in your incredible book is uh, that uh, what had been covered up by the president's critics is the fact that the president had left a standing order uh, and that uh, modified B-29s, which I have been able to learn through my own research, were to be unflagged, dr piloted by anti-Castro Cubans flown out of Nicaragua, were supposed to take a preemptory strike at the Cuban Air Force, the T-33 jets uh, that Castro had on the ground, thus giving our men at the beach a fighting chance. And that that order was called off by McGeorge Bundy, McGeorge Bundy, uh, in a phone call to, uh, I believe it is Charles Cable, uh, I may have that wrong, it was one of the Cable brothers of the CIA, the other brother being mayor of Dallas. Now, this is extraordinary news. Uh, the point, of course, of this is that we knew that Kennedy had agreed to the Bay of Pigs operation only if it looked, at least on the outside, like an indigenous uh, Cuban uprising. It was not to have the imprimatur of the United States. The attack, uh, uh, the air support by American jets on the beach was not part of the operational plan and should have needed to be had the president's order been carried out. Ladies and gentlemen, this is extraordinary history. Mr. Hawkins, my hat is off to you. Well, thanks, Roger. The interesting thing about it was when JFK became president, he was presented with this plan, which had already been approved in the Eisenhower administration and cooked up by Alan Dulles of CIA. He had misgivings about the plan, and they were pushing him to have the American military get involved with air cover for the exile invasion. He was not at all comfortable with that and was willing to go along with the plan for the Cuban exiles to fly in from Nicaragua and take out the uh, Cuban Air Force. The for the landing on the beach. The interesting thing is, of course, Bundy canceled that behind his back. And uh, that's something for more and more histor historians to dig into, is what was that all about? Well, I don't need to tell you. Bundy is, of course, the McGeorge Bundy, is the brother of William Bundy, uh, who was a target of Senator Joseph McCarthy in his initial probing as to communist influence in the CIA. It was really... McCarthy's threat to the Central Intelligence Agency that drove Eisenhower uh, uh, to the conclusion that McCarthy had to be destroyed. And you make an extraordinary case in this book that McCarthy checks into a military hospital with a banged up knee, which he has hurt uh, as a war injury and then exacerbated playing touch football according to a Life magazine piece that I was able to find. He goes into the hospital for a sore knee 
and six days later, approximately, he is dead of acute uh, hepatitis. Now, uh, the liberal left, Drew Pearson and uh, Edward R. Murrow and others, viciously spread the idea that McCarthy was an alcoholic, and nobody would deny that Joe liked a belt, but he was uh, not dying of cirrhosis, and he did not die of cirrhosis, and he drank no more than, say, Barry Goldwater. Uh, it is uh, interesting that McGeorge Bundy is the man who makes the call. Uh, tell us about the connection of the two cables, because I didn't have that precisely right. Charles Cable was a retired general who then joined the CIA. And, of course, his uh, brother, Earl, wound up being mayor of Dallas and was the mayor at the time of the Kennedy assassination. And, in fact, uh, apparently Cable played a pivotal role in deciding the route of the motorcade and was right, in that's the motorcade. Exact, that's exactly correct. Yeah. Earl Cable being being part of the same Johnson syndicate, which controls the, the uh, Dallas County prosecutor, the Dallas City Police, the Dallas County Sheriff's Office, uh, and of course, uh, in 1963, crime, murder, the murder even of the president, under uh, is not a federal crime, but a state crime. Therefore, the examination leads uh, immediately to the Johnson ring. Uh, I really found uh, the revelations about the connections between the Kennedy family and Joe McCarthy uh, revelatory. I knew that Robert Kennedy uh, had worked uh, in the Senate under McCarthy. I was unaware that uh, that they were present at uh, McCarthy's funeral, that the Kennedys, one of the Kennedy sisters was a bridesmaid in Joe McCarthy's wedding. I knew that Fighting Joe had dated two of the Kennedy sisters. Now, in this new book that's out on the streets now, How Robert Kennedy Became a Liberal Icon, None of that is curiously mentioned. The fact that Robert Kennedy was a staunch anti-communist, that was never mentioned in this book. There is no question that he has a swing uh, to the left after the murder of his brother. He is probably uh, dealing with the fact that at least on some level he is partially responsible. Uh, but your, your, uh, your delineation of the McCarthy-Kennedy relationship was one of the highlights of this book. Well, it really uh, started in some respects with the father, Joe, who was a staunch anti-communist and, of course, got himself in trouble when he was ambassador to Great Britain for arguing that uh, it would be folly to get in a war with Hitler and that Hitler should be encouraged to go after the Soviet Union. And uh, that was when, you know, he really played his cards as a staunch anti-communist. But I found something in my research that I had not seen you know, anywhere previously were reports that when Jack Kennedy and Joe McCarthy were in the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific in World War II, that they met then and hit it off. And there was one report of McCarthy going out on a PT boat with Kennedy and getting a chance to fire the machine guns. And it wasn't PT-109, which had already been sunk. I think it was, I believe, PT-52. That was the new command that Jack Kennedy took over. But the fact is, they may have begun a friendship then. But I hadn't found that until, you know, within a few months of uh, completing the book. It was something I added uh, pretty much at the last minute. Well, uh, that is extraordinary. As I recall, McCarthy would later tell a friend that JFK let him shoot the guns. Uh, an extraordinary piece of scholarship. Uh, J.C. Hawkins uh, with the very highly recommended book, Betrayal at Bethesda. You can get it at the Stone Cold Truth store. Go to stonecoldtruth.com. Soon be available at the InfoWars call. Congratulations on this amazing achievement. Roger, I greatly appreciate it. It means a lot coming from you, given your own authorship of a number of great books. And I'm looking forward to getting a copy of Tricky Dick when it comes out. Uh, I be it my pleasure to send it your way. You're at the War Room, and I'm your host, Roger Stone. What an extraordinary celebration yesterday was, the one-year anniversary of an upheaval by the American people to throw off the yoke of the two-party duopoly that has run this country into the ground, to give us a, a second chance, a chance to indeed make America great. And who better to lead this 
than an outsider, somebody not connected and not responsible to the for the failed policies of the past. Someone who, like us, is tired of the endless foreign wars, tired of uh, an abusive deep state that violates and erodes our civil liberties, tired of career politicians who spend and borrow uh, into eternity and raise our taxes while they do it, tired of the bureaucrats who have negotiated the shady trade deals that have sucked the jobs out of America, tired of those who pass the high tax rates that choke what could be a vibrant and robust economy. I'm just sobering up. Yesterday was such a great day, Owen. Uh, but it harkened me back to a time long ago when I was working in Washington uh, as a lobbyist for Donald Trump. Uh, I was in Washington. He was in New York. I called him and told him I needed to see him on a matter of urgency pertaining to a specific piece of legislation in which he had an interest. Uh, and he told me no, that he had to fly to Atlantic City with a number of his executives by helicopter and asked if I couldn't come the following day. I told him that the, it would not wait that long and that I really needed to see him to go over proposed language. And he said, all right, fly up immediately. I will send the helicopter down with my crew and then have it sent back for me. I flew immediately to New York and took a cab from what was then Idlewild Airport. Uh, no, I guess by then we were Kennedy, uh, back into the city to Trump Tower. Fifteen minutes into my meeting, his uh, longtime assistant, Norma Federer, came into the room ashen-faced and said, Mr. Trump, uh, Clint Pagano is uh, the superintendent of New Jersey State Police is on the line. He has terrible news. Mr. Trump, Donald, picked up the phone and the superintendent of state police said, Mr. Trump, I'm sorry to tell you that the helicopter that your company uh, uh, had uh, leased crashed in the Pinelands and there were no survivors. I knew at that moment Donald Trump was destined, saved for a purpose. Uh, I have never said, and I don't say it today, that I saved his life. Perhaps God saved his life working through me, but I understood that his life was preserved, spared for a higher purpose. And now we know what that purpose is, to take on the globalists and those who destroy America as we know it, to take on those who don't believe in the sovereignty or the exceptionalism or the promise of America, those who would like to homogenize us into some kind of world government, the neocons, the Clintons and the Bushes, lining their pockets while they pursue policies that make the American people weaker and poorer. That is what Donald Trump was elected to change. And now those in the deep state make no doubt about it. They threaten his existence. No one should take any uh, a solace uh, or rest on our laurels because of our great victory, which we celebrated only yesterday. Now the greatest challenge will come. Mr. Mueller is the Lord High Executioner for the neocons. He has done the dirty work for the Clintons and the Bushes from BCCI to the mortgage meltdown to Uranium One. Let's not forget 9-11. He is the executioner for the deep state, and he has Donald J. Trump in his sights. It scares me because I don't know that General Kelly and those immediately around the president have made him fully aware of the danger that Mr. Mueller, a runaway prosecutor, poses. So we shall see. While I'm at it, however, I want to address something from the first segment when the name of Pete Santilli came up. For those of you who don't know, Pete Santilli is a journalist and a fine one at that, and he was covering the standoff uh, between the Bundy Rancher family and the Bureau of Law Enforcement, pardon me, the Bureau of Land Management, when the jackbooted thugs uh, uh, came onto the property in an attempt to seize the cattle of Bundy. Now, I want to be extraordinarily clear that the legal basis for Clive Bundy's failure to pay uh, past due grazing fees is based on his belief that the land did not belong to the federal government, but to the state government. Judge Andrew Napolitano confirms this, that, they, that the idea that lands that are not owned by the a state or a private owner are automatically owned by the federal government is false. But you see, Clark County, where Bundy was ranching, he was the last rancher family left. 
And Senator Harry Reid wanted this land for a solar power project. So Bundy was treated like a common criminal. And here's what we know. Clive and Bundy tried to pay his grazing fees to the Clark Clark County clerk, to the state of Nevada. So the idea that he was a deadbeat is a lie because he believed legally that's where they should be paid. What's going on in the Bundy trial is a travesty. Judge Gloria Navarro refuses to let them choose their own counsel, denies them pretrial release. They've been in prison now almost close to two years, despite the fact that none of the men, the Bundys or their supporters, have criminal records. They're not allowed to call witnesses in their own defense. They are not allowed to have a summation by their lawyers. They are incarcerated and kept in shackles in the courtroom. This is the oppressive boot of the federal government. And therefore, I urge you to go to StoneColdTruth.com where we have a petition that you can sign to President Donald J. Trump. There is a way to get justice in this case, folks. Urge President Trump to review this case and pardon the Bundy ranchers and their supporters. Pete Santilli did nothing other than cover a story. He was improperly and falsely arrested. He is a journalist. He wasn't waving a gun. He was waving a camera. And so much for the Bundy drama. Owen, how are you doing? Doing just fine. I love to uh, see you fired up here. We are celebrating the mag anniversary. We're bringing a close to our 34-hour broadcast. We're about to take a break here, Roger. I know you wanted to get into some calls on the other side, but I'm just curious. I, I covered this in the first hour. Everyone's accusing everyone in Hollywood of this, that, sexual assault, and the other thing. Now you've got Roy Moore being accused. He says it's fake news. Mitch McConnell is already jumping on it, saying he needs to step aside if true. Roger, what is this age we're living in where you just say, he touched me, he looked at me, I feel like I was assaulted, and then it's just a truth with, with, with no court, no jury, no litigation, nothing. It's just you accuse and then it becomes real. Well, look, I, I want to reserve judgment until I see the facts. All I've seen is a headline. Uh, in the case of Donald Trump, insinuations were made, and they had no factual basis. Uh, in the case of Bill Clinton, there were many instances where he wasn't legally charged, but there were witnesses and women willing to come forward and other credible supporters and other supporting witnesses. So I do think if you're going to take the crimes of Harvey Weinstein seriously, and we do, each individual situation must be judged. Right now, all I've seen is a charge. Now, if this is a credible case, I frankly think that Roy Moore would do himself and the president uh, a service. But if he steps down, do not replace him with a quizzling. Uh, Welcome back. I'm Roger Stone, and you're here in the War Room at InfoWars. From time to time, I have to remind the patriots, the Info Warriors, that freedom isn't free. Uh, and that we are the tip of the spear. We are the leaders among libertarian-oriented Americans in our opposition to the global, uh, 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 the globalists and their neocon allies who would uh, end America as we know it. We are in a vital struggle for the future of Western civilization, and we don't have a David Rockefeller or a George Soros or some other hedge fund billionaire like Paul Singer writing us multi-million dollar checks uh, to spread the word. We have to defend, depend on the individual Info Warrior and other like-minded patriots to go to the Infowars.com store uh, and look at the extraordinary products that we carry. Uh, I myself love the First Amendment oriented t-shirts. And right now, every T-shirt you find on the site uh, is at 50% off. Now, the important thing to recognize is that this includes the, uh, the iconic Bill Clinton rape T-shirt. This T-shirt will end up in the Smithsonian, folks. This is the T-shirt that I designed and Alex Jones told the world about when he posted $250,000 in a contest in which anyone wearing this shirt who got on TV got $1,000, and if they were able to audibly say Bill Clinton is a rapist, they got five. This was the guerrilla tactic that we used to break the news blackout of the mainstream media who tried to explain the former president's antics as 
infidelities or indiscretions. No, they were assaults and violence against women and rape, and this was the only way to let people know it. Every time I go to a book signing, every time I go uh, to a Proud Boys rally, every time I go to a Tea Party gathering, the number of rape t-shirts warms my heart. So please, now, there's an extraordinary price at $9.98. These will end up in the Smithsonian. There is no question whatsoever that we are not going to print more. This is the last run. These were made during the fight against Hillary Clinton and the atheistic, godless, communist rule that he would, she would have brought to this country. So, folks, go to the site now and support Alex Jones in this extraordinary expansion. Now, every day, 10 hours guaranteed, Owen Scheuer, Roger Stone... This is great, great stuff, and it's only because you loyally support us at the site, and it's a win-win. You will never buy anything on this site that doesn't have many testimonials, isn't rigorously tested to be the best of the genre. You can find other male vitality uh, uh, formulas. There's plenty in the drugstore, but none with the quality and the strength of super male vitality, which today, 50% off. Michael Zimmerman wouldn't be caught dead without this product. And when used uh, synergistically with Anthroplex, you get a turbocharged result. These prices will not last very long, folks, so please go to the site and help us out. Owen, uh, I think we have some folks on the line, and um, this is my favorite part. Our number, for those who don't know, 888-201-2244. Uh, if you want a question for Owen, Owen, right off the bat, I must tell you, that tie is a complete winner, complete winner, very uh, old school, Harvard feeling. Uh, and, uh, you know, since Owen replaced Jake Tapper on the international <laughs> best dress list, uh, and I hear that fake, I mean, Jake Tapper is very upset. So, Owen, let's that go explains to the a lot. What do we got? It does. That explains a lot. Let's go. Let's start off with Andy in Nebraska, who wants to talk about oh, all the sexual hello, abuse coming out of Hollywood. Yes, go ahead, Andy. So first of all, do I think all the accusations are real? I, it doesn't seem very likely that it is, but with the, with the fact that so many are coming out, it's pretty obvious that there's a trend, and there's a trend of sexual harassment, abuse, pedophilia in Hollywood. In Hollywood, I don't know what you, uh, I think you would agree with that. One more, Aaron, a couple of other things. I hope you enjoyed watching the uh, watching the liberals free uh, liberals scream helplessly into the sky. I sure did out in mm. Omaha. And <laughs> and one more thing, I'd like I I prefer to I want to I want to ask Roger about this. Um. So, this, so the president has and the president has taken the side of Spain as it pertains to Catalonia, and I don't know if he's getting if he's getting all the info he needs about it. So if, yeah, I think, yeah. Okay, so we I, got I think the, I, uh, I, think we... I, get, I get the gist of your question. Let me address it. Um, look, I think this is yet another example of the Bush holdover influence on the Trump administration. We saw it in the number of troops we are keeping in Afghanistan. We saw it on the strike on the Syrian air base, although to his credit, The president pared the size of that down and then refused the entreaties of the Bush Quislings around him to send 150,000 troops, just as he turned down the suggestion of uh, H.R. McMaster that he send 50,000 troops uh, to Afghanistan. But in the case of Catalonia, you have an establishment State Department uh, carrying the globalist line, which is to support the Spanish government when you have the uh, obviously the the overwhelming support for and secession by the Catalonian one, people. I mean, exactly. People are pro-independence activists are being arrested without warrants. The democratically elected government, with the exception of four of Carlos Puigdemont's ministers and Carlos Puigdemont, have all been arrested. The Speaker of the Parliament has been arrested. The Spanish police violently attacked. Catalans who only voted, only voted in the referendum. I think, um, no, I this think isn't, um, not, 
all this information is getting to Trump. And I think that, I think if it does get to him, that we could actually see some real good come out, uh, come out of that region. Well, let me say this. I think Julian Assange's reporting on this has been extraordinarily courageous. He is one who actually um, runs a risk by alienating the Spanish government, uh, yet he does what's right, and he, he has championed uh, and put forward a lot of information that is supportive of the freedom fighters. This proves that he is a journalist and in no one's pocket. If he were, he'd be currying favor with the Spanish right now to try to uh, save his asylum where Ecuador is under extraordinary pressure to turn him out in the street where, of course, the deep state would like to lynch him. Mr. Assange's sin, very simple, Owen, he's a journalist and he reports the truth and the truth hurts the globalists and the neocons. They loved it when the truth embarrassed George W. Bush, but now when it embarrasses the Clintons and Barack Obama and the deep state, not so much. Yeah, they really like to have a veil of secrecy, Roger. And what Julian Assange has essentially done with his journalism is he's removed some of those layers and he's exposed what these people are actually saying, thinking and doing behind closed doors. And of course, the establishment can't have that. It was terrible for the Clinton campaign in the last election. And I'm not surprised that they want to demonize Julian Assange. And as far as, you know, Trump and his thoughts on Spain, I know that I follow, you know, Trump's actions just as much as you do and everything he says. I, I would say that until Trump makes a loud statement that is to the point and right on target and actually addresses this head on, I don't really I don't really consider President Trump as addressing it. Um, maybe he's made a comment here or there that seems to be leaning one way or the other. But until President Trump attacks an issue head on, I, I think that that's when you can really understand what Trump is thinking. As far as these things are concerned, Roger, uh, final 20 seconds, your thoughts. Uh, I totally agree. The president tells us that he is for legal marijuana. Jeff Sessions keeps insisting they're going to crack down on it. The president has not yet spoken. So we will wait and we will hear from the president and he says it and then he follows through every time. That's why we voted for him. Another segment with Roger. All right. Welcome back to the war room. We've got Roger Stone on and Roger just went into his super stone booth did a 360 and came out in his superstone attire. Roger, my goodness. I want to point out uh, uh, to you, Owen, that this is the In Your Face InfoWars shirt. There is something about this shirt, and we're going to give you a good solid look at it. There's something about this shirt that drives the libtards wild. Today, two of them accosted my grandson and I as we were getting out of the car at a local oh my shopping center. Let's just say it did not go well for them. In any event, uh, this shirt, like all of the shirts at the Infowars store, now at 50% off. This one is my personal favorite. It seems to inflame liberals to a stake of foaming. They foam at the mouth when they see this shirt. It's hard to really explain, but um, like Election Light, when I enjoyed their discomfort, when uh, there's nothing that tastes better than the tears of liberals, as our colleague Paul Joseph Watson would put it, this has emerged as my favorite t-shirt. Let's go back to the board here and see who we have uh, who has questions for the great Owen Scheuer or myself. It looks like Lee in New York is going to be next up. Go ahead, Lee. Hey, guys. I'm um, glad you guys got me on the show tonight. I'm a fellow New Yorker. And, uh, you know, I could maybe meet Mr. Stone one day and, you know, just uh, have a wrap and exchange of the mind. But my question or my point was, uh, you know, the Las Vegas shooting. We could see a clear you know, connection between what happened in Saudi Arabia with the arrest of the billionaire. And it does look like it was possibly a gun, maybe a gun trafficking incident that went bad. And somebody had ordered them to make an example, you know, for the promotion of their agenda as far as, you know, the Second Amendment. Well, the the cover-up seems to me to be extraordinary. The problem here is it's very hard to make any judgments about Las Vegas because we have so little real information. And the good information we do have has mostly been collected by citizen bloggers, citizen journalist bloggers who have brought it to places like Infowars.com. Owen? Yeah, it's it's really convoluted. I have to agree with you on that, Roger. It's tough to 
really reach any firm conclusions because of there's the, all the cloud and all the fog around the investigation. So many anomalies, so many cover ups, so many well, changes about, to the timeline. What about the YouTube videos of the helicopters firing onto the people down? Yeah, exactly. You know? There's another angle with the helicopters and the flight records and all of that stuff. I mean, there's so much fog of this that I, I kind of fall back on what's been my safest analysis, that this was literally an event coordinated by multiple entities, multiple people coordinated against the United States and the United States people to, to honestly probably kill hundreds, if not thousands of people. And thankfully, for whatever the reason is, I think that this attack that was meant to harm many more people did not go as they planned it. Well, no, uh, and we controversial. Well, it, great question, Lee, and we thank you for your call. Uh, speaking of New York uh, and getting together there, uh, when Rob Dew let people know on Infowars that we would be getting down uh, in Times Square at 11 o'clock, we had a hearty band of info warriors from the greater New York area, some from New Jersey, Connecticut, Long Island, Westchester, and yes, New York City. Uh, we did some singing. We talked a lot of the politics and we had a good time. We're going to do this again. This was a historic night. Do and I had already stormed the CNN corporate headquarters demanding they produce Jake Tapper or at least Anderson Cooper or Brooke Baldwin, but instead we got some burly Irish security guard who told us to get lost, and we did. But it was a good shot anyway. Uh, who do we have on the call board, Owen? Next up would be Victor, who also wants to talk Vegas shooting. Go ahead, Victor. All right, yeah, hello? Yes. Um, yeah, um, I have some information um, about the Las Vegas shooting or whatever. I looked up. And um, have you heard about a, a man named uh, Dan Bozerian? Yes. Um, he was at the Las Vegas shooting. He was one of the people who was actually an uh, eyewitness at the shooting and did a lot of uh, the recording there. And um, he was actually on EMZ a long time ago saying that um, about Hillary Clinton and um, saying that he wasn't going to let her on her plane anymore. Uh, I think he was using her plane for... Um, when she was uh, campaigning? I'm not familiar with that. Um, on, I do know that on, Dan Belzerian was at the, the shooting and did witness it and, and did record. I am aware of that. Um, I well, actually, on, I will actually tell you, I personally reached out to Dan to try to get him on the show to share his eyewitness testimony. Uh, I never heard back, but um, I did try to reach out to him. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you guys did anything about that because I, I, I did see something that was on TMZ a long time ago where he said he wasn't going to let Hillary Clinton on his plane anymore. Yeah, I don't know why well, Hillary Clinton... You know, so, Go ahead, uh, Again, some, sometimes people's 15 minutes comes up twice, uh, and uh, as I understand it, he, he ran a charter jet service, which are open to anyone in the public uh, chartering, and he made a decision not to do business with Hillary Clinton. Understandable. Uh, but I do recall that. Um, but we're going to research this more, and we thank you for your call. Uh, the uh, other thing I would tell you, Owen, that I was very pleased about is uh, the uh, Salon and um, the Business Insider and others have correctly reported that my legal bills for my uh, being questioned in the House and Senate Intelligence Russian witch hunt plus the completely phony lawsuit ginned up against me by the Obama-blessed front group uh, Project for Democracy, which is essentially using this frivolous harassment suit for fundraising purposes, my legal bills finally hit uh, $497,000. Uh, and uh, I have not yet even given testimony to the Senate, which I may yet be called for. Alex Jones very graciously and generously sent $10,000, the one of the first donors to the Legal Defense Fund. But if you want to help the Stone family out, you can go to stonedefensefund.com, uh, and every penny uh, will be appreciated. There are at least uh, three stories up on the Internet. One tells you I'm worth $40 million. One tells you I'm worth $20 million, to which I say I wish. 
Uh, this is a burden on our family, and we appreciate the support of every Trump supporter and every Info Warriors. And I gratefully appreciate the support of Alex Jones for his very generous contribution. Roger, while we're on that topic, Tom Fitton from Judicial Watch has filed a FOIA request to get the financial details as to how much money is being cost the taxpayers because of this Russian collusion probe. I can only imagine if your legal bills have reached almost half a million, what the legal bills that Roger Mueller is racking up could possibly uh, be reaching. I mean, what do you think about that? I think you mean Paul Manafort, correct? Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Mueller searching into Manafort. Yes. Yeah. No, look, Man Manafort and his sidekick, uh, Rich Sancho Panza Gates, have racked up tens of, of uh, I would say Manafort is in the multi-million dollar category easily, three, four. That's the whole point, is to break him, to try to make him tell Robert Mueller what he wants to hear, that the president was colluding, uh, that Manafort was colluding with the Russians and that Trump knew and approved. He's not going to do that. I think it's just the fact that all of the charges against him, none of them relate to tax evasion and none of them relate to Russia. Ukraine is not Russia. Manafort's work in Russia was 100% legal. Money cannot be laundered if it is not dirty to begin with. As long as he paid taxes on it when he brought any amount of money or paid for things in the United States, then he is not in violation. This is a weak indictment, but it is arm twisting by Mr. Mueller. Well, I'd like to see this be turned on Mr. Mueller. I'd like to see him have to release the financial records of how much this is costing the American taxpayer. And honestly, it's time for the investigation to be turned on him. But he won't recuse himself, but Jess Sessions will conveniently. Final seconds, Roger yeah. Stone, parting words. Yes, uh, bravo for Judicial Watch. Tom Fitton's a good man. He runs a great organization, and they are worthy of your contributions. They do great, great work. No doubt, as does Roger Stone with us on The War Room every day here. So we take a break now. Final segment, excuse me, final hour on the other side. We're joined by Stephanie Hamill. Don't go anywhere.